quiero hacer una historia. De... Hi, 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 everyone. How are you doing? Welcome um, to join us today on the week 12 in our session, Climate Change or and Nature, the Global Youth Climate Training. And here we are, happy to start with this, the 12th session that we have. And we want to be part of your learning process, share on your social networks the work and the highlights of the session. And please don't forget to tag us, theglobalyouth.co on, on Twitter. It will be important if you go with the Smith School, Oxford Net Zero, the Global Youth G as well. And on LinkedIn, you can tag us as Oxford Net Zero and the Global Youth Coalition. The official hashtags are GYC and Global Youth Training 2023. Today, our moderators, the amazing and incredible Alexis McGiver from Oxford Net Zero, who is making all this possible, with myself, Agustin Ocaña, the chairperson of the Global Youth Coalition, and we are really happy to be here with you guys today. So the next session, don't forget to come to the next session related to climate negotiations, because we are 56 days till COP28. Can you believe that? It's almost there. November 30, COP28 in Dubai is about to take place. So this is a reminder that this will be the final course session, Monday 30 of November with Brianna Kraft. She is the senior researcher at IIED, an expert in climate negotiations. And today we will have these amazing speakers in climate change and nature. And we will go with Audrey Wagner, Program Co Coordinator at the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative at the University of Oxford. Then we will go with Dr. John Brubis, Environmental Conservationist and Director of Research Building Indigenous Initiatives in Heritage. And with Mirna Fernandez, researcher at the biodiversity program at, of Third World Network and environmental engineer. The agenda of today, let's just check it like super fast. We will start with the session introduction. Here we are. Then we will go with Adri Wagner. We will jump with some Q questions, you know, we wanna hear from you. What are the questions that you have? Don't forget guys, it's important that you write the the questions so we can ask from the speakers and get as much information as we can. Then we will go with Dr. John Brovis. We will have a, a break. We will come with our you the speaker, a surprise, body patil or ocean shark. And we will close with Mirna Fernandez and some questions as well. So there we go. Thanks so much, Agustin, and it's really nice to see you all here for our uh, penultimate session. So we've been through almost uh, 12 sessions together, 11 full sessions. This is our 12th session together. Um, and as Agustin mentioned, we have one final session, which is taking place uh, not in two weeks time as usual, but on the 30th of October. And the reason why we have this gap is that our final session um, we'll talk about more uh, later in the session, but it's going to be an interactive session focused on some of the learnings that we already have uh, done in this program and building some common positions ahead of COP28. So the reason why we have it on the 30th is to give you a little bit of time to prepare for that. 
So um, something that will make it easier to prepare is our collaborative notes that we'll take through the course and as well as all the resources that we shared. So we're just putting this QR code on the screen and uh, Liliana will just be sharing the link um, right now in the chat for the um, collaborative document that really helps us when we take notes together and share, uh, share key takeaways. Fantastic. So without too much further ado, we'll pass on to our first speaker, Audrey. So Audrey is, I'm very lucky to call her a friend and a colleague at the University of Oxford. She is uh, an expert on nature-based solutions and focuses on the intersection of climate adaptation, climate mitigation, biodiversity, and human well-being. She is, as Agustin mentioned, the program coordinator of the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative, um, which is here at the University of Oxford, and has worked there for more than two years on nature-based solutions, case studies, and climate and biodiversity in international policy agreements. Audrey did the massive and successful undertaking of leading the Oxford delegation last year to the Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal, Canada, we're both Canadian, uh, in December of last year, where the historic Kunmig Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was agreed. And she also attended COP27 uh, in Egypt. She has an MSc in Environmental Change and Management from the University of Oxford and a BSc in Environment and Food Production with a minor in International Agriculture from McGill University in Canada. Previously, she has worked for the UN World Food Programme, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and has founded youth groups focusing on regenerative food systems and permaculture. So thank you so much, Audrey, for being with us. You're always my go-to person when I have any question about nature. So we're really excited to hear your presentation today. And Audrey will be walking us through the CBD um, and the Convention on Biological Diversity and the intersections between climate and nature in the international sphere. So without further ado, pass it over to you, Audrey, and thank you so much for giving up your time uh, to be with us today. Great. It is an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Alexis, for that fantastic uh, that, that introduction. I hope everyone can see my screen um, right now. Perfect. Thanks for the confirmation. Great. So it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking to you today about the UN Convention on Biological Diversity as well as nature-based solutions. So the first part, I'm going to try to speak slowly here. I'm remembering the, the interpreters. The first part of my presentation is about the UN Convention on biological diversity, the CBD. So up until now in this program, you've mostly focused on climate, right, on the UNFCCC. Um, but actually in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, there were three sister Rio conventions that were created. So the first one, the, UNF the UNFCCC, the Convention on Climate Change that you've all been focusing on, but then a second one on combating desertification and a third one on the, UN the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity or the UNCBD, which I'll be describing um, to you today. So uh, let's start by kind of thinking first about some of the, the interlinkages between climate and biodiversity. There's many different kind of complex interlinkages here. So firstly, uh, just need to do something to my screen to see my slides better. There we go. Sorry about that. So firstly, um, climate change and biodiversity share some of the same drivers. So for example, land use change. On the other hand, climate change is itself a biodiverse, a, a, a driver of biodiversity loss. Um, and, and so therefore limiting climate change can help to minimize biodiversity loss. Um, and uh, as well, actions to tackle biodiversity loss can also help to solve climate change. Um, so many different types of interlinkages there. But we need to be careful some actions aimed at tackling climate change may harm biodiversity. So for instance, monocultures. So there's really a need for safeguards here and to think about the synergies and the trade-offs between climate and biodiversity. Um, but let's take a step back here, go back to the ba basics, think about what actually is biodiversity. So the word biodiversity stands for biological diversity, and it is the variability of all life. So it ranges from genetic diversity within species to different species to even the diversity of different ecosystems. And why is biodiversity important? So first of all, biodiversity has intrinsic value, that is value in and of itself. You know, these species like ourselves have evolved throughout millennia and they have a right to exist um, on, on the surface of, of this planet, um, regardless of their use to humans. 
And then second of all, there's what we call anthropocentric value. So this is the value that biodiversity has to humans. Um, and so uh, when we talk about anthropocentric value, we, we can think about how bio biodiversity secures all that we need from nature. And this is typically called ecosystem services. Many people may have heard of this term, but we're actually shifting um, IPBES and, and, and Globally, people are shifting towards calling the calling these nature's contribution to people, so NCPs. And we can see on the diagram on the left here that some of these typically will include food, medicine, of course, clean water, clean air, flood control, these types of things is what we're, we're talking about. Um, we know that higher biodiversity improves both the, the flow and the resilience of these so-called ecosystem services, and this has been found in study after, after scientific study. We also know that biodiversity increases the resilience to climate extremes. So halting biodiversity loss can help us with climate mitigation and adaptation. This is one of the one of the reasons why we value biodiversity. Just just one of them. Um, we need to remind ourselves that, of course, people depend on on biodiversity. So we all depend on nature. Ecosystems are what sustain us. Um, but 1.2 billion people, mostly in tropical countries, are highly and directly dependent on nature for their basic daily human needs. So it's important to, to remember that. And nature is also of high cultural and spiritual value to many, especially indigenous peoples and, um, and different cultures around the world. However, un unfortunately and sadly, biodiversity loss is accelerating. So humans are causing what we're what we call a sixth mass extinction, where the extinction rates are much much higher than the natural um, extinction rates. Uh, rates Th currently. 1 million species of animals and plants are threatened with extinction um, out of a total of, of 8 million. This gives you kind of an idea of how serious and severe this is. And the World Economic Forum ranked bi biodiversity loss as the third top global risk by severity, um, you know, over, over war and all these things. The actual, the top one was climate change um, over, over the coming years. And so, okay, what, what are the drivers? What is causing this biodiversity loss? So there are five direct drivers of biodiversity loss. The first of these is land use change or sea use change. So for instance, deforestation, for example, um, and, and note that land use change is also uh, a driver, one of the drivers of climate change, right? So interesting, going back to those inter interlinkages there. Um, secondly, uh, the, sec the second biggest driver of biodiversity loss is direct exploitation. So for instance, overfishing, direct harvesting. The third one is climate change. So climate change is causing some biodiversity loss. Um, the fourth one is pollution and the fifth one is invasive alien species. Um, so these are the actual direct causes but then um, people have gone into looking at the indirect drivers and so one some of the indirect drivers include socioeconomic factors of course so for instance capitalism right. Um, okay so let's so so we have this big problem of biodiversity loss and the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, the UNCBD, was created to tackle and hopefully solve um, this, this, this problem, right? And so here we have a great diagram which compares the UNFCCC, which you're all familiar with, to the structure and some of the key elements of the CBD to help you kind of understand some, some of the elements of the CBP, right? So um, on the UNFCCC side, the kind of big landmark agreement is the Paris Agreement, right, that we're all familiar with. On the CBD side, we have the Global Biodiversity Framework, so the GBF, which I'll go into um, in, in a bit, which is a big kind of landmark, very important agreement. Uh, both, both bodies are governed by COPs, right? So Conference of Parties. So you'll have the Climate COP, of course, the one coming up is COP28, um, but you have also the Biodiversity COPs, which are every two years. So last COP was um, in December 2022, COP15, uh, and then the upcoming COP is not this year, but next year, um, COP, COP16. Uh, on the climate side, of course, you have the N NDCs, so the Nationally Determined Contributions, 
And on the uh, biodiversity side, you have what are called NBSAP, so basically National Biodiversity Plans. Um, on the finance side, you have the GCF, the Green Climate Fund on the uh, climate side, and then the GEF, the Global Environment Facility on the biodiversity side. And lastly, uh, what I wanted to bring your attention to here is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Body. So of course, IPCC, um, which came out with, with fantastically important reports and on the biodiversity side, IPBES. So I just wanted to quickly bring uh, attention to IPBES. I would strongly recommend looking into the reports. Of course, they're very lengthy, but they have um, kind of shorter summary uh, summaries for policymakers similar to the IPCC. Very, very important work, important reports. Um, and there was one joint report uh, done between IPBES and uh, a workshop report done through, through both, right, together, talking about the synergies and the trade-offs. Um, so in at COP15 in Montreal in December 2022, last year, um, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was decided, short, GBF for short. And so it's valid until 2030. So it's basically the, the plan to tackle biodiversity between now and 2030. Um, and it's really kind of hailed in some circles as the, the, as the Paris Agreement equivalent of biodiversity in, in its importance, and it's our international compass for tackling biodiversity loss. And so what does this large agreement have? Well, it, uh, amongst other things, it has 23 targets. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, it, the, the document is actually relatively short, so I would encourage people to read through it. It's only maybe 20 or so pages, um, so I would recommend reading all these targets in, in, in your own time. I'm going to focus today on two targets. So the first one that I'll briefly describe to you is this kind of flagship target that everyone talks about um, that's called 30 by 30. And so it's by no means the most important target, um, but I, I do need to bring it up as it's one that people really kind of focus on. Um, so in short, uh, it, it calls to ensure and enable that by 2030, at least 30% of land, water, et cetera, will be conserved. Um, so this kind of involves protected areas, that kind of thing. Um, and very important wording in this target, um, and, and just to mention here that, of course, like, like in the Paris Agreement and like in the UNFCCC, the words of all of these targets um, are very, very carefully thought out, of course, and are debated and negotiated, and you can spend hours and hours on one single word here. So that's why I've included this, this full quote, quote, which I won't read out, but the, the wording here is, is very, very crucial, the, the exact wording. Um, I've highlighted a part at the bottom, um, which reads recognizing and respecting the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, including over their traditional ter territories. So this was a very important um, part of the wording in this target. There was a lot of concerns. There were a lot of concerns. Um, leading up to the, the COP and the, develop, the the signing of the GBF and during the COP about um, potential human rights violations, potentially uh, kind of um, asked for, or, or the GBF allowing um, human rights violations. So there was really a lot of pressure, a lot of, a lot of fight, good fight for um, strong language on human rights being at the heart of, of the GBF. And so we saw that at least on target three, um, it's not perfect, but people were pretty happy with the, the wording that, that ended up getting in there um, due to the kind of activism of, of, of many people fighting for, for this strong wording to be in it. Um, the other target, which I'll briefly mention, is target eight. So this is the target on biodiversity and climate, of course, high, highly relevant um, to this talk. It's shorter, so I'll read it out. Um, minimize the impact of climate change and ocean acidification on biodiversity and increase its resilience through mitigation adaptation and disaster risk reduction actions, including through nature-based solutions and or ecosystem-based approaches while minimizing negative and fostering positive impacts of climate action on biodiversity. So that's the wording that we got. Um, and, and it's important because through this, we can, we can use this wording and think about this wording to kind of think about the synergies and linkages between the two conventions. Um, of course, here I've highlighted the wording nature-based solutions, which appears both in this target and in another one. And that leads me into the second part of my presentation here on nature-based solutions. 
So what are nature-based solutions? Um, in short, Nature-based solutions involve working with nature to address societal challenges, providing benefits for both human well-being and biodiversity. So we can see in this kind of you know, complex diagram here, we have in the middle, uh, written in black, nature-based solutions, people working with nature. We have different actions, protection, restoration, et cetera, those leading out to the different, what we would call ecosystem services or nature's contribution to people or the different kind of multiple benefits that leading into overall human well-being and biodiversity and then going back to the center of the diagram written in in the yellow part we have biodiversity underpinning it all and I'll go I'll go into this um, in, in more detail. So concretely to get our mind wrapped around this what do nature-based solutions involve? So they involve the protection for four different actions. So the first is protection, the conservation of existing ecosystems. So for instance, um, land titling to protect indigenous territories would be included in this protection category. Second of all, restoration, restoring destroyed or degraded ecosystems. Third, the man management, so improved sustainable management. So this can include agroforestry, agroecology, uh, et cetera. And fourth, creation, so the establishment of novel ecosystems that would not occur naturally. And so this, for example, would include, would include urban areas, so urban green areas, for instance, or artificial oyster reefs, as, as another example. Um, there has been a, an official definition of, of uh, nature-based solutions decided through the UN Environment Assembly, UNEA, which has been multilaterally agreed upon by all the parties to UNEA. And this is really key for, for some reasons, what, which I'll explain in a bit. So I'll read out this definition and highlight a particular part. So the official definition reads that nature-based solutions are actions to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use, and manage natural or modified terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems, which address social, economic, environmental challenges effectively and adaptively, while simultaneously providing human well-being, ecosystem services, and resilience, and biodiversity benefits. Quite a mouthful, but again, this is you know one of one of these definitions that are decided upon um, over over hours and hours and hours of kind of negotiating over precise wording, right? So so very the wording um, ends up being quite important here, particularly the parts that I've bolded um, that emphasize that nature based solutions must by definition provide human well being and biodiversity benefits. So if they do not provide these two things, human well being and biodiversity benefits, then um, they should not be, they, they do not correspond to the definition of NBS and should therefore not be called NBS. Um, looking into nature-based solutions for biodiversity. So again, just to re-emphasize this point, to qualify as a nature-based solution, an action must support or enhance biodiversity. And so the NBS concept is based on the science and knowledge that healthy biodiverse ecosystems produce a diverse range of ecosystem services. And so biodiversity is not just a co-benefit of, of NBS, but it's really a necessary precondition underpinning the successful provisioning of benefits. So we can think back to that diagram where we had biodiversity, you know, really at the bottom underpinning the provision of, of those benefits, right? You can't have NBS without biodiversity. Um, thinking about NBS and benefits for, for people. So nature-based solutions are for people and by people working with nature as part of nature. And so we must recognize as part of this framework that humans and nature are not separate and recognize the plurality of values that nature holds for different people. And so the extent to which nature brings benefits will really depend on, on the how, the word how is key, on how we implement nature-based solutions. Um, so thinking about this how, about the implementation, now nature-based solutions must be designed, led, implemented, managed, and monitored by Indigenous peoples and local communities. And so uh, IPLCs must also be the, the, the primary beneficiaries of NBS. 
We, we understand that Indigenous peoples and local communities have been stewards of land and have been implementing NBS, of course, for millennia, right? These actions that, that we, if we go back to those four kind of actions, we're talking about the, the protection of, for instance, forests, the restoration of ecosystems, sustainable management. These are all actions that have been around for, for millennia that people have, have been doing. And so actions that aim to support NBS must su support them, must support um, Indigenous peoples and local communities to, to allow them to continue, continue to do so. And we must let them lead on NBS. Um, however, there have been several concerns, right? I'm sure many people in, in the virtual room today have, have heard of these, right? Concerns around greenwashing, concerns around human rights. So when we're talking about land um, and different kind of competing uses for land, we know that human rights can be violated and livelihoods can be destroyed. So there's potentials for land grabs, potentials for exclusions. Um, there are, are concerns around disrespecting people's intimate connection with nature and commodifying nature so right so questions around is is nbs you know potentially doing this should we be we, we should be concerned about this um concerns around greenwashing with carbon offsets and nbs being thought of as a dangerous distraction from reducing fossil fuels um there are also issues around additionality and permanence right so these are different kind of questions to think about about different different um different concerns to, to consider uh, so, so thinking about these, we must ensure that nature-based solutions are implemented using a human rights-based approach with participatory and equitable governance. That, that's really key. And so therefore, it's very important to double down on the definition. That's why I spent time kind of really presenting and reading out that whole UNEA definition to you all, um, doubling down on the definition that NBS must improve biodiversity and must um, improve human well-being uh, and to call out um, things that are being labeled as NBS that do not follow this definition to really reclaim the term, reclaim the term from corporates who uh, might be using it for are, are, are certainly using it for, for greenwashing in, in many cases. Um, particularly around risks of misuse of NBS for biodiversity. So in some cases, so-called NBS are undermining biodiversity. So we, we would not call this NBS. This does not fall into the definition of NBS, but it has been labeled as NBS. So for instance, monocultures or afforestation in the wrong places and an, an excessive focus on tree planting can result in maladaptation. Um, and so it, it's really important to be clear that monoculture plantations are not NBS. BEX, bioenergy capture and storage is not NBS. Um, and, and there are also risks around tree planting, displacing other critical ecosystems such as wetlands, peatlands, and grasslands, which are incredibly important um, in and of their, their, their own right for biodiversity. So thinking about climate change mitigation, NBS can help us to mitigate climate change, but Let's let's think about this. There's there's significant limitations. So um, thinking about the breakdown of total emissions, reminding ourselves that 22 percent of emissions come from the agriculture, forestry and other land use sector. So the youthful loose sector. So so it makes sense that NBS can help reduce this 22 percent of greenhouse gas emissions from the AFLU sector. Right. Um, then perhaps NBS can also help to go beyond this reduction and possibly help with greenhouse gas removals, but we need to uh, beware of an overestimation. We can't overestimate how, how much it, um, how much this, this, this is. Um, and, and some studies have overestimated this number. So there are many limitations and um, importantly, further warming, further, further, further climate change and warming compromises the, the performance or the potential of, um, of nature to store this carbon, thinking about forest fires, right, these types of, um, these risks. Very critically, and importantly, nature-based solutions are not a substitute for decarbonization, and they're not an alternative to technological solutions. So we must use technology to decarbonize the energy sector, aviation, shipping, industry, transport, and we must keep fossil fuels in the ground, and we must get emissions down to as close to zero 
as possible, right? So we really need a combination of engineered and nature-based solutions to adapt to climate change. Um, and it's important to, to keep reminding ourselves that NBS are not a silver bullet. Uh, and anyone who who says that, you know, NBS are the answer to everything, um, you know, that that's 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 mis uh, mistaken. Um, however, uh, so that was a bit about the mitigation side. Thinking about the adaptation side, though, the story is much more positive. There's much more potential here. NB, the, the NBS term actually originated firstly from the adaptation side and then got a bit co-opted by the mitigation side of things. Um, so, so it's really important to kind of bring, bring it back to, to its roots and think about the importance of NBS for, for adaptation. And we know that nature can help us adapt to climate change in multiple ways, right? So for instance, it can um, help with food security, soil fertility, can help with urban cooling in cities, flood protection in cities, flood and coastal protection as well. It can help with health benefits. So all of these can be linked to climate change um, adaptation. And, and several studies have shown that NBS are, are very effective, um, sometimes more effective than engineered solutions, sometimes not always, um, at, at helping us adapt to climate change. And so wrapping up here, um, nature-based solutions we know can bring multiple benefits, right? We've talked about some of these benefits. So um, climate adaptation, disaster risk reduction, it can help to combat desertification. Um, of course, some carbon sequestration to, to a limited amount, conserve biodiversity, of course, right? Um, a note on language here. So um, we want to, we, we've been moving away from the dominant idea that carbon sequestration is the primary benefit and that biodiversity and, and all, all these other benefits are being co-benefits, right? So we were moving um, towards the language more of multiple benefits, wider benefits, and kind of phasing out the, the use of co-benefits um, to really yeah, emphasize that carbon is not you know, more important than the other benefits um, and that we're talking about um, all, all the different benefits that the NBS can provide. And so this, this kind of diagram that we have mirrors the previous diagram where we had kind of the different, you know, some, some examples of the different benefits that could be potentially provided by NBS if they are implemented correctly with the human ba rights-based approach and following the, the the proper science, NBS can help unite multilateral, different multilateral agreements and conventions. So here we have, you know, the, the UNFCCC, the CBD, but also the SDGs, right? Um, important SDGs on land, on poverty, on food. We have the UNCCD on desertification. Ramsar is about wetlands. Um, the other one that we have here is on disaster risk reduction, right? So NBS can be a component of all of these different agreements to help uh, us achieve them. So there are, uh, and I'm, this is my last slide, or actually, sorry, I'm second to last, but I know I'm, I'm just over time. I have my timer going here. There are implications for COP28 and COP16, so integrating the climate and nature agendas. We need to synergize NDCs, NAPs, which are national adaptation plans within the UNFCCC, and NBSAPs, which, again, are the reporting um, mechanisms in, in the, the CBD and NBSAPs. Um, there's a need for national and subnational policy coherence and mainstreaming. Um, so making sure that climate and biodiversity are mainstreamed throughout national policies, no matter what department it is, say. And there's a need to mainstream climate and biodiversity action into, into all policies and sectors, and really taking a whole of society approach and also a need to align financing and reporting on all of these different conventions. Um, as they as they relate to nature, land, climate, etc. And so lastly, I wanted to end on the NBSI's four guiding principles for NBS. So this is a, a summary repetition of what I just said. First of all, nature-based solutions are not a substitute for the rapid phase out of fossil fuels and must not delay urgent action to decarbonize our economies. Second of all, nature-based solutions involve a wide range of ecosystems. Third, they must be designed, implemented, managed by Indigenous peoples and local communities. And fourth, nature-based solutions must support or enhance biodiversity. So that's it. And I would really welcome any questions or comments and looking forward to, uh, to speaking with you all. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, I just love the way that you capture so much content and also so much nuance because it's really easy um, as we, Audrey and I were just at a meeting together yesterday. It's really easy to just have blanket statements on NBS that sound really easy and neat. And actually there's so much nuance involved here that you've done a really good job at pulling out. So thank you so much for clarifying that that landscape to us. Um, we have a few questions that come, have come through on Menti. So I'm going to ask Two of you, uh, two of them at the same time, and if you could um, answer them back to back, that would be great. Just in the interest of time. Um, so the first is, um, how does one ensure that carbon offsets that companies promote and take place using nature-based solutions don't end up maladapted or promote mal sustainability or mal adaptation instead? Um, and the second is, uh, there's from a biology student who's interested in climate change and conservation. What are the organiz organizations or platforms that are doing good work at this intersection that you'd recommend following? Great. Okay. Um, so, so I'll tackle the first question first. So this is a super key question, right? And of course, we we don't have the answer. If we had the answer, then um, then then you know that that would be a huge chunk of the problem solved. Um, but we're doing a lot of work here at the University of Oxford on on kind of two aspects, right? So on the one side, you have the social science human aspect of it. And on the other side, you have the kind of ecological science of it, right? And we wanna make sure that on both of these fronts, the, the social science and the ecological science side, we're, we're, we're implementing th these things right and we're not resulting in um, perverse outcomes, maladaptation, right? So on the ecology side, it's really kind of looking at the science and knowledge, not just you know, traditional Western science, but also indigenous knowledge and, and, and knowledge of place about which interventions, which species, et cetera, are appropriate. So it's really taking the time to understand, you know, right species, right place, um, what are the risks in that area, et cetera. So that can really be done um, and through that angle. On the human side angle, we have many different kind of types of research. Um, so on the one hand, we have the component that it's extremely important to follow uh, and, and let lead the Indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, of course, if it's in a country that perhaps there are uh, no Indigenous peoples, for instance, in, in the UK, then it would be more kind of local communities, local knowledge. But of course, many of these um, are, are in the global south and in countries which, which do have strong uh, presence of, of Indigenous peoples. So it's, it's following their lead. And, and then another component that, that links to that is about governance, right? So, so that that incorporates the, the Indigenous people's piece, but it's about participatory governance. So really kind of putting in the, these, these practices, and there's many different guidance coming out. For instance, our group is working on um, guidance focused in the UK, but having lessons globally on what participatory governance, so, so guidance on participatory types of participatory governance and ways to ensure that these types of things are implemented through processes which are truly participatory, which truly are equitable, um, et cetera. And so there's there's so much research on this. And of course, you know, you, you come to the problem that that the research is, is a bit in an ivory tower and is not being kind of distilled to the people on, on the ground. So how do you distill this in, in a form that's that's um that's that's accessible is is a big question as well. And I think people are working on that. But yeah, I would just to summarize my answer, you have the eco ecological science on the one hand, right species, right place, the modeling of future climate risks, et cetera. And then you have the governance aspect. What does good governance look like? What does part what does equitable participation look like? Um, and then just briefly on the on the on the other question, I think it would be better for me to kind of have a brainstorm and, and share some kind of links with with you guys afterwards. Um, of course, for instance, Myrna is, is a speaker who's coming up. She does a lot of work with the Global Bi uh, Global Youth Biodiversity Network. So, so that would be ours. Of course, I work with the Nature Based Solutions Initiative here at the University of Oxford. So so we're another one. Um, yeah, I, I could list uh, a bunch but um, it might be easier to, to connect with me afterwards on, on that to kind of share a bit of a list after I've had a thing. Yeah, thanks so much, Audrey. That would be great. It would be really great to have um, something that we can send to participants afterwards. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much, Audrey. I really appreciate it. And with that, I'll hand over to Agustin, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, that was really impressive, Audrey. Thank you so much for that. And actually, we are looking forward to work and to collaborate with nature-based solutions on going projects the next year with the Global Youth Coalition. 
So it's really useful for us that our community hear this all. And right now, let's uh, welcome our second speaker, Dr. John Rubis. Uh, she has about 12 years in hands on primate conservation, field work, and local community work in both Indonesian and Malaysian. Malajan e. Borneo before embarking on her graduate studies. As an environmental geographer, she holds a deep field PhD from the University of Oxford, UK, and previously held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Sydney Environment Institute, University of Sydney. Since 2020, Jan is currently the co-chair of Documenting Territories Dam for the ECCA Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas Global Consortium and a member of the International, International Indigenous Forum of Biodiversity and a member of, in, uh, oh, sorry, she is the co-founder of Build, Building Initiatives in Indigenous Heritage to support community conservation and cultural heritage in her Bidayo homeland Badu, Sarak, and elsewhere. Sorry, Dr. Jonis, if I pronounce it not correctly. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Augustine. And hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. I'm just going to share my slides. Is that is that working? All right. Thank you. Well, I would like to begin uh, by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be here with you today. I feel honored by the invitation to speak in this session because it's a full circle for me um, because I was one of the organizers of the student-run climate change conference in Oxford about a decade ago uh, when I was a student at uh, SOGI and, and Oriel College. And I was in charge of organizing sessions on indigenous peoples and climate change. So it's nice to be a speaker in a similar conference uh, for you today. I started off my career as a field conservationist, uh, which meant I did a lot of primate field work as a biologist living and working in my native island of Borneo. And I've had a full circle journey since working in mainstream conservation as we know it. Uh, that is to say ideas of fortress conservation into a field that is starting to become hopefully more inclusive, equitable and right space. As such, you know, we, we talk about how we need to support custodian communities, indigenous and local communities, secure their respective rights to self-determined governance systems, cultures and collective lands and territories. So regardless of whether these lands are labeled as protected areas, wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, as community conserved areas or OECMs or territories of life, custodians also exist in place whether their presence or limited rights are supported or not by authorities or even conservation NGOs. So the global evidence, it's clear from the peer reviewed articles to UN reports, they demonstrate that there's a significant overlap between high biodiversity and priority conservation areas and territories and areas that are stewarded, governed and managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. To argue otherwise is to be left behind by the international bodies that recognize the rights of indigenous peoples to self-determination, cultural identity, traditional knowledge, land and resources, among others, and have included them in global conservation targets and guidelines. Now, I wanted to also reflect a bit about the term you may encounter as you go into international spaces, such as the CBD and the UNFCC, IPLC, Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities. So you may understand why some organizations uh, use this term. So I, um, as, as mentioned, I'm currently the co-chair of Documenting Territories theme for the Global Consortium, ICCA. Uh, it's an association supporting the global movement for Indigenous peoples and local communities, collective territories of life. So we recently produced a local to global analysis of territories and areas conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities, which is available online. And I encourage all of you to read it as it contains many case studies from around the world. And in the work that we do, we wanted to reflect upon the diverse realities and perspectives of the multitudes of indigenous peoples and communities that may self-identify and be recognized by their peers of what we call custodians of 
territories of life. So territories of life, it's not a label, it's not a marketing term, but rather an expression uh, to describe a major phenomena, widespread and diverse. So it is age old, it is white, you know, it's dynamic phenomena that has many different manifestations and names around the world. Examples include uh, wherever you come from, Wulaya Adat, Akao, Himas, Tagal, um, Oran, Ili, Asan, Rumak, uh, and so forth. And a diverse political context, they may be referred to as commons and greens, ancestral domains, country, uh, community conserved areas, uh, territorios autonomos comunitarios, communales, territorios de vida, territorios del buen vivir, sacred natural sites, locally managed marine areas, and fishing grounds, and many more. So territories of life and custodians are interdependent concepts, which means you know, they, they depend on, upon each other. A territory of life is a territory that nourishes indigenous people or a community, and a custodian is indigenous people or community that cares for a territory of life. So for the consortium, we see three defining characteristics for territories of life, which is a close and deep connection between a territory and its custodian, indigenous people or community, and the custodian is capable or, or rather has developed and enforced and, and are enforcing rules around about the territory, which has a well-functioning governance institution. And the rules and the efforts of the custodian positively contribute to the conservation of nature and community livelihoods and well-being. So when we talk about indigenous peoples, we mean a historical continuity with the pre-colonial societies that develop on their territories and consider themselves distinct from the ter societies that are now prevailing on these territories. So in this sense, yes, the term indigenous could be you know, considered political and it takes its full meaning against the historical background of colonial, neo-colonial and post-colonial states engaging with issues of justice and solidarity. So the concept of indigenous people is extremely rich and should not be used in simplistic ways or flatten the particular histories and cultural diversities of peoples. We also recognize local communities, so those who are self-recognized as such and often. So for example, you know, if you're from South America, like the, the case of the Afro-Colombian communities that also have a long association with the territories that have traditionally used, used or lived on. So in our work, we particularly use the term custodians, meaning that a community custodian of a territory of life does possess or is actively developing a governance institution with the capacity of establishing and enforcing rules for territorial access and use. So the cust conditions of con custodianship may be historically complex as when communities were force forcefully moved from their original territories. So the global evidence is clear that community co uh, custodians play an outsized role in the governance, conservation and sustainable use of the world's biodiversity and nature these custodians actively protect and conserve an astounding diversity of globally relevant species, habitats, and ecosystems. And they provide a basis for clean water, clean air, healthy food, and the livelihoods for people far beyond their boundaries. But as the awareness and acceptance of IPLCs, outsized contribution to global biodiversity conservation grows, so do the challenges. And as much as there is clear international guidance, for example, the UNDRIP, that supports the rights of indigenous peoples and ethnic and so forth, as much as there's countless of academic papers and concepts like uh, nature-based you know, uh, solutions supporting IPLC conservation, there are no guarantees on how this will be implemented at the local level. So thus in recognizing that indigenous peoples and local communities play an outsized role in con governance, conservation and sustainable use of a world's biodiversity and nature, there is an urgent need for national conservation policies that provide the restitution of territories of life alienated from indigenous peoples and community custodians and that recognize and support custodians, including economically as they conserve bicultural diversity in both their conserved areas and protected areas established by the state. And the urgent need for a global conservation regime, you know, building upon territories of life where indigenous peoples and community custodians resume their historical responsibility of sustainably managing biodiversity for the benefit of all, but also more importantly, 
receive support, both financially and otherwise, in doing so. So these two points are important to recognize as such globally because when you are the de facto custodian of lands and territories, you, or rather indigenous peoples and local communities, are also the front lines of resistance. Uh, in this post-colonial age, for many, not all, IPLCs still face expropriation of land, forced displacement, denial of self-governance, and lack of access to livelihoods and loss of culture and spiritual sites, and so forth. So the historical and ongoing context of injustices, colonization, mytil, mit I can't even pronounce that word, forced eviction, uh, fragmentation and commodification of nature, land and water grabbing, you know, for extract, extract, extraction, financial speculations, polluting and destructive production ventures and infrastructure, and all forms of international and domestic deceit, indoctrination and violent change, have been impacting territories of life and the custodians and defenders. And even when, and even when unjustly criminalized, the vitality of territories of life or global conservation as we understand it, are still being maintained by the traditional livelihoods and the governance institutions of indigenous peoples and community custodians. So as such, you know, on global platforms, when you go into the UNFCC and CBD and so forth, we should continue to support indigenous peoples and local communities to secure the collective lands and territories of life and what we call a minimum bundle of rights as a key missing link in global commitments and national level implementation for biodiversity conservation and to also counter climate change. So to expand this further, what do we mean? We need to explicitly recognize indigenous peoples and local communities for their outside roles in protecting and conserving nature we need to place human rights at the heart of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We need to include human rights related indicators in the monitoring framework with disaggregated data for indigenous peoples and women. We need to explicitly identify industries that are most harmful for biodiversity and committing to divesting from these industries as soon as possible and to increase ambition in the targets intended to halt drivers of biodiversity loss. We need human rights safeguards and accountability mechanisms and funding uh, for conservation initiatives by government and non-government entities. So currently communities contribution biodiversity conservation, it's counted, you know, like we, you know, it's, it's recognized and counted in the benefit for national and international conservation targets without receiving any counterpart recognition or support. So that's not enough. As much as we say, you know, like, yes, we support and explicitly support IPLC, where is the money? You know, like, where is the actual tangible support? And often, you know, this tokenistic engagement and participation of IPLCs in not just workshops and programs, but, you know, but also like other ventures that we say that we want to support IPLCs, but in the, in the heart of it, how are we actually engaging, truthfully engaging IPLCs. So for the ICCA consortium, the term ICCA, Territories of Life, uh, just to reiterate, stands for territories that and areas governed, managed, and conserved by custodian indigenous peoples and local communities. So unfortunately, for many state-centric conservation policies and laws, particularly in countries where national frameworks do not provide appropriate recognition or support for IPLCs, their territories of life or ICCAs are similarly not recognized or supported. So currently in the Philippines, there's an ICCA bill that looks towards providing recognition and hopefully that could set an example. So while there is a significant global shift in being more receptive, including IPLCs in conservation or other solutions, when viewed only through the lenses of you know, international conservation frameworks, particularly around protected areas or OECMs, and I promise I'll get into that later on, communities' contributions to a diverse, healthy planet are often instrumentalized and conditional uh, without recognition of the extraordinary challenges and disruptions they are facing. So many territories governed by indigenous peoples and local communities face serious threats still from commercial development, insecure land tenure, and the erosion of culture and traditional knowledge. Now, um, currently there's a lot of interest 
uh, for the IPLT to identify and report the conserved territories and areas as OECMs or uh, other effective area-based conservation measures. This is a new conservation approach separate from protected areas. Um, we would say that it actually came from the idea of ICCAs rather than ICCAs coming from OECMs. It's the OECMs deriving um, uh, deriving sort of the ideas from how indigenous peoples and local communities have been already conserving areas. But there are limited material benefits and incentives uh, for communities to do so. So we already heard about target three, also known as 30 by 30, which requires 30% of the world's land and water, especially areas with important biodiversity and ecosystems to be conserved by 2030 through protected areas or other effective area-based cons conservation measures, which is OECMs. And we, again, we have to emphasize it's the recognition of indigenous and traditional territories and respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities that we can see, you know, um, this, you know, being manifested. And just to also point out, the OECMs also depend on the quality and effectiveness as, as well as the quantity. So there's a risk of creating paper, what we call paper parks that only exist on paper uh, with a rapid expansion of protected and conserved areas to meet these goals. So currently uh, the CBD um, member states are preparing their, what well, we really heard the MSAP. So the MSAP is the National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, uh, which is the main tool to implement the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So there are several targets that I mentioned in the MSAPs uh, or, or within the framework as well that mention indigenous peoples and local communities' rights, uh, participation and rights base, but the interpretation, unfortunately, well, the interpretation is up to the, each member state. So what does that mean in the end? So one of the ways that we work uh, include with focusing on, you know, from our members from IPLC organizations nationally and regionally to work with government agencies where invited uh, on national conservation policies and laws, particularly where national frameworks do not provide appropriate recognition and support for indigenous peoples and local communities in general, or especially in the context of nature conservation. So we, we say that, you know, while we, you know, while we address um, area-based targets of species loss, we also have to address the main drivers of biodiversity loss. We have to be more explicit about you know, what is driving biodiversity loss? And we also have to empower the local and traditional government system because that leads overall to global conservation. Now, these are some of the recommendations that IPLC groups have been advocating on the national and regional and global level, um, access to justice, when acts of harm are done onto communities in the service of conservation or other mechanisms uh, where, you know, we need accountability mechanisms put in place particularly in large projects are funded by global actors. We need access to information. And this applies, you know, not just for communities, but also local environmental groups that are working in areas uh, that may be affected by state decisions. We all have a, a role to play to ensure that there's equitable and effective participation in plans made and supporting the synergies with global agreements that support custodians' outsized role in conservation. And yet global advocacy and global goals must also start locally, nationally, and regionally. So some recommendations, you know, going forward, we should support indigenous local communities and their organizations to critically engage. So what we mean by local implement implementation, it means that we have to critically engage in any country processes on protected areas or OECMs in context of the broader self-determined priorities, government agencies, they need to strengthen the in-house capacity to understand and engage with communities in a respectful and rights-affirming way, where one of the main goals is to get indigenous systems of resource stewardship as part of the state policies on resource um, on, on, on you know, part of state policies on conservation, uh, the use of community protocols, and that's part of the Nagoya protocol as, as well to support and affirm community self-governance to address state agencies as well who act with impunity to impose the interpretation of what constitutes customary rights. And also one of the biggest conversation right now for IPLCs involved in these global mechanisms around you know, conservation and CBD is around funding and access to funding and its governance 
and intends funders should require human rights safeguards and accountability mechanisms and funding related to indigenous peoples and local communities and conservation. So, you know, we should, I, mean, I put down conservation community, but you know, this anyone who's interested in the CBD process and UNFCC, we have to recognize uh, custodians contribution to conservation on their own terms and their own right. Thank you. And I'm, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Impressive, John. Yes, actually, we got a bunch of questions over here. Let me go through them. I just want to remark, thank you for the impressive work that you have been doing. Actually, the indigenous territories all over the planet are in danger. It's, if, for example, in my country right now, because of illegal mining, there's a lot of uh, people that has been killed in the Amazon forest. And this is just spreading out. And it's something that we all have to advocate. So someone is asking us, how can we get involved to support the territories of life? And uh, just before, also another question is, how can indigenous communities keep their territories without exploit exploiting their lands, taking in account that the cost of living is increasing for them as well? Let's go with those two questions first and, and check them out, yeah. Thank you for the question. So the first question is, how do we get more involved? I suppose it starts, like I like I mentioned, like start locally. Where are you from, you know, or where are you currently from? Um, and start there. Um, start learning more about where you're from. I, I don't know who this person is, is asking this question. And then getting, yeah, getting more involved because there are organizations already that are there in place uh, that are supporting the work. So you don't always, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. Um, communities have always been resisting and acting. They've never really say the words activism or, you know, like it's, they're just there in presence, you know, they're already protecting the lands, you know, before you came up with terms of conservation. So I, I would encourage you to start locally. And if you happen to be, if you're a student, you know, like maybe in the UK or, you know, you're away from your territories, um, maybe like, yeah, start learning about your, you know, learning about where you're from and start advocating you know on a global level because that's where we need that support as well is to have a spotlight in the areas that people are not seeing and it's you know like often and I think yeah that's important to have a spotlight and just sort of recognizing um recognizing the ways that you can get involved um so the second question was about how do we support communities yes correct who are rightfully you know like placing all this precious precious to convert the lands um into you know, uh, yeah, in, into non-conservation areas. And often that is that is pressures that are coming from the state, you know, but also we have to recognize sort of like the, the global and historical role that colonization has done to this planet. But yes, I mean, when you go down like for the global self, it's the states, you know, like um, trying to pressure communities to convert land, you know, for example, in plantations and such. That's, this is why I mentioned about why funding direct funding, direct access to funding is such a huge conversation right now on the global level. Um, because, you know, like uh, as advocates and communities and activists, when you know, did they go on, you know, to UNFCC and, and, and they say, yes, we should support, explicitly support, but what does it mean in terms of funding? You know, like, and where's the funding going into? Like, how do we then support communities who, who then, you know, need the funds? Um, so I would say also local and national activists also say we need to put the pressure on states themselves. Because if you if you truly recognize that communities are already contributing to global conservation, um, you should be you know, putting in the same resources that you, you know, that you put in in supporting your own the protected areas. So consider that another sort of, you know, we talk about third pathway. So look at you know, putting pressure into like, you know, providing financial mechanisms. Where communities don't have to um, convert land, but also, you know, like recognizing that there are different. Um, when we say community conserved areas, I mean for for many communities, the areas have like different, you know, different ways, uh, different. Um, what do you call it? So they have different uh, different uses. So yes, they will have the protected Sorry. areas, but they would also convert areas for like say for you know for for planting so there's you know like this different the different ways of how to use up the land so it's ensuring that the the very conserved areas are, are protected but also recognizing that communities also 
use the land, you know, to plant crops and such, you know, for their own needs. Yeah, so that should be supported. It's, it's actually, that's a great example to mention. And I love this, uh, this part because, for, ex for example, when I was learning in the university back then, I get to understand that agroforestry is a concept that nowadays yes. people is talking a lot, but it all started in the jungle. It all started with the yes. community. The indigenous communities and they are talk, calling them chakras is this a space in the jungle where they are having their own resources so moving forward with another question is um how uh, do we move beyond tokenist inclusion of indigenous people are these examples of deep engagement that you send in any multi multilateral spaces and you also is mentioned something important that there's a lot of violence. Land defenders face this violence. How we can advocate for EPLCs safely and also for the maids that are not in the territory but are somewhere else, how they can support these peoples that are facing this violence? June. I mean, these are amazing, wonderful, and thoughtful questions. So thank you for, for having them. Try to remember. So the first question, I'm like, my mind goes, what's the first question? The, the first one was about... And they're in the um, chat, if you want to check them oh, out. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. It's a great question. So how do we move beyond tokenistic inclusion of indigenous peoples? I think, you know, when people say, and so I just, I just, when people say yes, we're including IPLCs as leaders and you know that are guiding these our programs. Ask, you know, like let's let's have names, you know, like let's have accountability in what you mean by that. Um, I, I think it's just also holding, that's why global activists are so important in sense of like holding that accountability. Uh, the deep engagement and seen in any multilateral spaces. Oh gosh. I mean, that's in multilateral, I mean, for me, because I work in the context of conservation, so I, I work mostly like, I'm interested in more the locally and regionally, like, what do we mean when we talk about engaging with indigenous peoples and local communities? So for me, it's also holding the elites, uh, the elites, uh, you know, people who may have indigenous identity, but are not necessarily having, you know, shared in, you know, these indigenous values, so holding them accountable. accountable. Um, I think that is important to point out as well, because one of the criticisms we get about like, yes, not all indigenous peoples can serve, but yes, you know, like for other communities, you don't hold them to such, you know, like these high standards. I mean, when we talk about indigenous conservation, we're, we're actually talking about like truly deep relationships, um, um, you know, um, with, the, with the territories and actual governance mechanisms. So let's be clear about that. So I, I'm not questioning multilateral spaces. I, I just say continue to support indigenous activists, indigenous and local and youth activists uh, in, in these spaces. I, I, I think a lot of people are, are recognizing, as I was saying, it's a global shift of recognizing and putting these words of you know, supporting indigenous peoples and local communities. But then we have to get to the meat of it. What do you mean by that? And often it's about, you know, in regards of like who's actually, you know, part of it, like who are the, who are these faces? You know, who are you truly engaging with? Um, and where's the direct access to funding uh, for the communities? Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, June. Sorry to interrupt you there. We are running oh, out of time. Oh, okay. We have I'll, write, all these I'll try to people. write on the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Yeah, that would help. Yeah. And also, we will share with the. Uh, we have, don't forget, guys, with, that we have terra.do, where you can access to the knowledge that June just uh, shared with us. Also there you will find the information and you can access to the previous uh, previous sessions as well. And remember we are doing this because we are all one. And before I'm looking at my friend Body out there ready to jump into the ocean, but before we go with Body, uh, we will have a five minutes uh, a break. So we can go take some water, refill yourself, a stretch a bit so you come here and learn a bit more. We go right now. Thank you, John, again. And now we go with some music and let's go with the break.
Amazing. Sorry, guys, we are a bit late. And now I am glad to introduce our youth speaker, Body Pat Hill. He is a UN recognized award winning Jet Seat Ocean Climate Solutionist dedicated to improving the interconnectedness between ocean and human health. He is the co creator of Ocean Uprise and Sea Dragon Studios and advises several love-based eco-organizations on a mission to protect our planet. Last week, actually, he presented to 250 world leaders and called it on a global deep sea mining ban, swift ratification of the high seas treaty, the recognition of ocean rights and investment into intergenerational collaboration, especially for youth lead solutions. He is a diving body of Agustin as well, my hermano. So welcome, buddy, for joining us today. Really happy to have you here. And please let us know with your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to share more about the High Seas Treaty. Um, of course, Augie just introduced me. So I'm going to get right into it and use this nine minutes to the best of my ability. Um, just a little quick story, though. So Last week during the UN General Assembly at New York Climate Week, I was in front of the, all these world leaders, including the president of Belize, the prime minister of Niue, a small remote Pacific island. We we're focused on nature-based solutions and biodiversity protection in regards to the oceans. And so I just want to bring some attention to the ocean um, and this really important note that really life in my experience learning and connecting with the ocean from the age of four when I dove my first coral reef taught me. And it's simple. It's that ocean health is equal to human health. And we know the ocean provides us and sustains us life. The ocean provides us majority of the oxygen that we breathe. The ocean produces seafood, livelihood, and so much more. So we're going to get into why it matters to protect, what you can do to protect it, and what this high seas treaty protecting about two thirds of all of planetary space, because the ocean is 70% of our planet, is so important. A quick note is that our bodies are 70% water. The planet is 70, over 70% water. We're inextricably connected to water. The same water that flows through us has flown through planetary systems from Malka to Makai, from mountain to ocean um, since time immemorial, since water has entered this planet. So um, I have basically been working in youth advocacy for the last four years since high school and for the last 12 years since starting a business in sixth grade. And Two years ago, I got the chance to be with the UN Secretary General advocating for the importance of intergenerational collaboration. And like local communities and indigenous peoples, um, advocacy entails, we're really looking for things that are taking support from institutions and multilateral organizations to the next level. So intergenerational collaboration for me looks like three key things. One, mentoring and supporting the next generation of young leaders. Two, investing in young people. It's something that we're always looking for. And I know Augie and all the team here can definitely relate to that. And three, having young people sit on executive boards um, and in C-suite positions of companies. It's really important. So those are the things we've been adv advocating for. And the UN Secretary General is basically like, yeah, that's a great idea afterwards. And I was like, if you implemented everything you said, you'd be a young man. And he definitely took that, um, hopefully in an uply have noticed some changes, including the establishment of the youth office since that time. So good things ahead for youth engagement. Um, and yeah, just giving you a quick visual of what the room looked like. It was myself and another young person from Earth Echo, and we were sharing these really important messages around the protection of the ocean. And because the ocean is such an important entity and living and breathing entity with rights recognized now, similar to the rights of nature, they're now being ratified within the UN declaration and the omnibus resolution space. Um, we are really stressing and prioritizing the importance of protecting the ocean in biodiversity and areas beyond national jurisdiction. So basically there are areas of the ocean that aren't belonging to a specific country and those areas are beyond national jurisdiction. And our goal was to advocate for the protection of those. Um, before this talk that we gave, which was basically sharing how our life in our lifetime, it took them 20 years to create and establish the High Seas Treaty. And in the same amount of time, it took 
us to be from when we popped out of our mother's wombs to be on the stage right there. So it was really interesting to put that into perspective for all of those world leaders, including the head of WWF, the IUCN, um, the COP28 presidency, Bloomberg Ocean Philanthropies, Puber Torelli, and Wildlife Conservation Society, so many more. Um, and it was really interesting to see how world leaders responded to that narrative that young people are really pushing the agenda forwards. Um, so I just wanted to touch on the high seas, what that is, if you've even ever heard of it. Um, a lot of people don't really understand the importance of the ocean. I know you all are a very hip group, so you definitely get that the ocean is so important for regulating our climate, it's regulating our heat, it's providing global circulation, atmospheric regulation, air sea exchange, um, but why the high seas? So the high seas are over half of the planet's surface, about two thirds. They're teeming with life and biodiversity. They regulate the climate. They provide over 3 billion people food, including most of the fish, if you eat fish, that you'll ever eat. Um, it supports livelihoods and it's essential and critical because it's such a large space for reaching 30 by 30, as previously discussed. And um, a really important thing to understand right now is that the high seas are under attack and oh, and basically the high seas are under attack from many different stressors. Of course, climate change, illegal overfishing, which goes into LCIP and human rights abuses at sea, pollution, shipping, we get most of our goods, about 90% of world goods that have gone through shipping containers. So it's really understand to it's really important to understand the impacts of shipping on the ocean, noise pollution, deep sea mining, which is an emerging threat. I'm not going to go too much into problems. I'm going to stay hopeful today. But deep sea bed mining is basically like clear cutting the ocean and the seafloor, um, except no one knows about it because no, most people can't see below the ocean and there's very little oceanic seabed monitoring. So we're trying to stop deep sea bed mining. And during my speech, I actually said we need global ban on deep sea mining. Jane Fonda then reinforced that twice. So there's definitely more momentum towards protecting the seafloor, which is a common heritage site of all of humankind. Um, of course, different geoengineering and poor governance is the biggest one. No one regulates the high seas. There is no police for the high seas. The open ocean is a very untamed place. Um, also, side note, this is a great white and great whites are incredible shark species. They're really important for regulating the ocean and they're needed and they're not as scary as they seem in Hollywood movies. Um, and yeah, so it was really successful because the day after giving that presentation to world leaders, there were basically 70 countries that signed on to protect the high seas treaty and signed on to um, the high seas treaty for the process of ratification that will take place over the next two years in the lead up to the UN Oceans Conference in Brest, France. Um, now that number of 70 is up to 81, and that's 21 more countries that then's needed to actually have the treaty in enforcement. So this was really exciting to see. And we do see that the power of youth advocacy can result in actual systemic change and can result in pushing different countries to result and sign on to treaties like the High Seas Treaty. Um, so that's really, really exciting. And that's just the start and another sign that youth advocacy against for the protection of nature, against extractive industry, against neocolonialism can have very effective outcomes. Even if the future does seem grim, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. So um, yeah, basically I think that's my time and I need to keep it short and sweet. So this is how you stay connected. And if you guys want, um, you can scan this little thing. I know we have to get to the next speaker soon, um, but that is me. And I would love to support anyone in their ocean and climate journey um, as they continue to grow. So I really, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, know that ocean health is human health and that the race to ratification of the High Seas Treaty is on. And we need every young person all around the world campaigning in their local country, their local municipality, and pushing their government to ratify the High Seas Treaty because it is one of the single most important treaties to protecting the ocean, which is the single most important entity on this planet. So let's go and youth all the way. Thank you. Thank you, buddy, for that amazing presentation. Something okay. to remark is that uh, every phone that you are buying 
is affecting the planet. And now the deep sea mining goes around the batteries that we are using. So now we go with Alexis. Thank you, buddy. Thank thanks. you so much, Agustin, and thanks, buddy. That was really lovely, um, like a really energizing and inspiring um, intervention. So thank you so much. And before I came to Oxford, I spent three and a bit years working at IUCN in the marine program, so and working a lot on deep sea mining. So I'm, I'm glad to see that the next generation of ocean leaders are taking that on as the fight. So thanks so much. Um, great. So we have a, a very quick um just a pulse check with all of you, just because our final session is coming up on October 30th. Um, please note that we've obviously been doing our sessions every other week, but we have a little bit more time between the 12th and our final sessions um, so that we should uh, to prepare our interactive activity. So we're going to have you all go to Menti, um, the same Menti that we've been using uh, and using the code 31888270. And this is the same code that you can also use for questions for Myrna coming up just in a second. And we're going to be picking three topics um, uh, to work on a position building exercise. Um, we're picking three so that people can adequately prepare. Um, but what we're going to do now is just vote on um, the sort of top three um, subject areas that you want to focus on uh, so that we can focus on that in the interactive session. So we'll be sending out materials ahead of time to. Uh, prep us all for that uh, interactive session uh, based on the vote that we have today. Um, so I think Gaia is sharing the results of the mentee. I'm also going to vote. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much. So we got some some split across nature and climate, climate finance and, and loss and damage. Um, we have our first one on sort of uh, general UNFCCC coming up. Great. Thanks so much. So we'll we'll ask you to um, to continue. Oh, climate finance is emerging as a top one. So thank you so much, everyone, for um, for voting there. We really appreciate you taking the time and we'll be sending out a pre preparation pack ahead of our final session together on October 30th. Um, and the way that the session will be structured on October 30th is that we will have Brianna, who's an incredible um, uh, incredible researcher and who works has worked closely on the negotiations for many years and has just written a book actually about her experience in the Paris Agreement negotiations. Um, so she'll be speaking, we'll have a testimony from a negotiator and then we'll go into the interactive activity. And you'll receive all of this information um, via email, but the final session will have everyone on Zoom. So previously we've had just the people who need translation on Zoom. Um, and instead for next session, because it's interactive, we'll have everyone on Zoom. So without further ado, I'll pass on to our final speaker, um, Marina Fernandez. Uh, we're really, really excited to have her here today. Just a reminder that you, you can use the same mentee to send her um, questions throughout her presentation. So Myrna is um, a researcher at the Biodiversity Program of Third World Network. She is an environmental engineer from Bolivia with an MSc in Tropical Biodiversity and Ecosystems. She has volunteered at different youth campaigns and organizations focused on um, non-formal education, climate change, biodiversity, and sustainable development. At the national level, she is actively engaged in Reacción Climática, which is a citizen collective promoting joint actions against climate change in Bolivia. And she advises the Global Youth Biodiversity Network Bolivia chapter called Cajayu. At the global level, she has been a former policy coordinator of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which she will be talking to us about today. And she's engaged in different multilateral environmental processes with her main focus on the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Her work experience um, has a massive range from environmental impact assessments to education and capacity development, to environmental advocacy and policy research um, and environmental technical assistance to indigenous peoples and local communities. So thank you so much, Myrna, for being with us today. Um, we're really, really looking forward to seeing you, to hearing your intervention. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Myrna. You, oh, just... now, uh, now you can hear me, right? Okay. 
Uh, thank you so much, Alexis. I'm very happy to, to be here. I'm very honored, especially given my fellow uh, co-panelists. So I hope that I will bring new insights to this conversation. I will uh, try to share my screen now. Mm. I'm sorry, my bandwidth is really um, short right now. So I'm trying to access it. Oh, thank you so much. I, I see you can access it before me. So um, can you help me passing my slides because I cannot access my, my presentation while I see it, that you can. Um, if yes, then I will uh, start my presentation and ask you to help uh, me with the slides passing. Uh, I will share some youth and gender perspectives on nature-based solutions and market-based approaches. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the youth engagement on biodiversity and the uh, role of DYBN. Uh, let's start with uh, um, youth. Uh, thank you for going to the next slide. Pursuit, our generation is facing biodiversity loss. We are a, besides that children and youth are more susceptible to the negative impacts of ecosystems damage, pollution and unclean water. A, we, have, we will live with the long-term consequences of this environmental harm for longer. So we are the generation that is starting to face all the impacts of the decisions that the last generation have taken. A, um, but we are still tokenized, we're marginalizing, and we're often excluded from environmental decision making, uh, which means that we don't have a say on uh, what's going to happen to our future, uh, even though uh, we are trying. And uh, these are great examples on how you are trying to self build capacity building and form positions and demand what we want to decision makers. But still, we have a long way to go to make this a reality. This is the generation of eco-anxiety. Actually, actually, the term of eco-anxiety ha has been uh, created uh, with our generation. It is a very recent term and it is a very um, a strong reality for all of us. Uh, the, the worrying about our future, the, the decision of uh, maybe I don't wanna bring children to this world because it's going to suck. Uh, it's something very present. We can go to the next one, please. Uh, we know that youth are excluded from decision making uh, very often. Um, we lack access to youth friendly information. That is also something important because we have this very long, very difficult to understand ag agreements and documents. And uh, how is it possible that we are going to make positions and uh, raise our voices if we don't even have access to information that is more easy to digest? for young people. Uh, something uh, more, uh, most of the times we are seeing as beneficiaries of projects, but not as leaders because we are not trusted that we are going to be able to, to lead a project and deal with the financial resources and all of this. Uh, we don't have direct resources as a consequence. So the resources that reach young people is very little as it happens with indigenous peoples and local communities and women as well. Uh, sometimes we are perceived too immature, not ready, too idealistic, we're too angry, we're too disruptive, or, or some of the times they're like, oh, you guys are so inspiring, but that doesn't lead to any change to our position in the decision-making processes. Uh, and sadly, tokenism and youth washing are common practices, which means that um, we are not being taken seriously and we are there just as a symbol. Uh, we're there for the picture, but we're not really there. Uh, to, to be able to draft uh, and design the decisions that are going to be taken. You can go to the next one, please. Uh, this is an example of one of uh, the Mentimeter activities that we do ourselves in, the, in Given. Uh, we ask it, young people, what biodiversity activities are you or have you been involved with? And this is just an example of how many things are young people doing right now with regards to biodiversity. Young people are doing research, they are doing advocacy, they are doing education. These are the biggest things that they are doing because they are big at wars, this is the world cloud. So it shows the, the, the things that have been repeating the most. Youth are working 
on policy advocacy, on restoration activities, on campaigning, eh, on conservation of biodiversity areas, wetlands, species monitoring. They are working on a project development, youth empowerment. I am not, I'm not going to read all of these, but you are really leading the change and doing so many things for biodiversity and climate adaptation and mitigation that we should really deserve a spot on the decision-making stage. We can go to the next one, please. And youth are drivers of transformative change. We are key implementers uh, of uh, these actions, as you have seen. We're on the front lines of the movements for the environment uh, and our rights must be respected and our priorities must be considered in the decision that affects us. Okay, next slide. Some principles uh, for youth engagement in the decision making processes. Uh, we want autonomy. We can be self organized and we can decide on our own structure and working style. Uh, we need uh, to be rights based and legally mandated on the decisions that are going to affect us. Uh, we need to design um, and be designated. Your people should not be made to compete for space uh, because this space should be uh, inherently for us and for other rights holders. Well resources, uh, which means that it is, this is not this is another privilege. This is a right. So every young person should be allowed to be equipped with the tools to be a part of the discussion. And finally, uh, we need accountability, uh, reporting and feedback mechanisms on, on how these things are working. And this is from the major group of children and youth uh, at the UN. Next slide. So a couple of words about GIVEN. Uh, we are uh, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, uh, the international coordination platform for youth participation at the CBD. Uh, we can go to the next slide. We are a global community uh, with very big numbers. <laughs> we are a a community with more than 50 national chapters uh, and regional chapters all over the world. We have um, more than 600 youth organizations uh, registered as part of our network in 172 countries, representing uh, more than a million young people. Uh, so uh, it is a very big network of young people committed to do biodiversity actions and advocate for biodiversity uh, at the national and global level. Next slide, please. On our youth-led action, we work on empowerment and capacity building, but also at advocacy uh, at UN level, but also at national levels. We work on campaigning for certain topics and we work on mobilization of grassroots. And next slide. We have national and regional consultations. Uh, this is very important because this is our way to uh, get positions of young people. Um, for example, for the post-2020 biodiversity framework, uh, we held consultations in over 110 countries. Uh, these consultations are happening at the local level. We have young people gathering together and saying their opinions of biodiversity. We have uh, hundreds of methods on <laughs> gathering their opinions uh, by dialogues, by getting posted, say, systems thinking activities. And uh, in that way, we... Um, try to get all the priorities from young people and condense them into the big priorities that we are going to push for in, in the negotiation. Next slide. So the youth priorities uh, that have been repeated in almost every single consultation that we had are intergenerational equity and full and effective participation of young people, education, especially a transformative education that is going to change uh, the way our societies uh, see nature, reconnecting us to nature and enabling us to be stewards of it. And uh, rights-based approaches for people and nature. Here we're talking about nature rights and human rights because they are interconnected and interdependent. Next slide. 
So our priorities have been uh, for the COP15 condensed in a document. Uh, it's called No Nature Without Justice. We have shared these priorities with decision makers and it can be uh, still downloaded and you can check in the link that you can see there. Uh, we prepare these uh, advocacy documents and we start our lobby efforts uh, with bilateral meetings way ahead the negotiations because we know that we need the support uh, from countries to make our priorities a reality into text. Next slide. So the COP15, uh, the outcome was the Kumi Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This is a, a milestone agreement that is going to guide biodiversity conservation and sustainable management for the last 10 years at least. And that's why it was very important for us to uh, have our priorities reflected here. And there are some wins, but also some losses uh, in the final text. Um, something important is that we have a stronger target 21 that is very similar to the language of the Escazú Agreement for a, the ones in Latin America and the Caribbean and the, and the Arauz Convention for the ones in Europe. Uh, it talks about the access to participation, justice and information of indigenous peoples, women and youth, the rights to land of IPLCs and the protection of environmental defenders, being this one of the first global agreements uh, that talks about environmental defenders, which is a crucial topic. Uh, for all of us, but especially in Latin America, since we are the deadliest continent to environmental defenders. And this has been a victory, not only of youth, but of uh, indigenous peoples women and women, uh, and some NGOs that have been pushing strongly for this uh, language in the target. We have a intergenerational equity as a principle to guide implementation of the framework. Uh, we have transformative, innovative, and interdisciplinary education at all levels as a key approach in the implementation. And the whole framework uh, is supposed to follow a human rights-based approach. And this is one of the principles that is uh, in the section C that is about considerations for the framework. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about some developments on the CBD and UNFCCC with regards to nature-based solutions and market-based approaches. Next slide. We're going to go through this very fast uh, because I just want you to see uh, the dimensions of, uh, this, uh, of this language in different decisions of the framework. On the target eight on climate change, uh, Audrey already mentioned it. We have a uh, dimension that a uh, the, the minimization of the impact of climate change on biodiversity is going to happen, uh, including through nature-based solutions and slash or ecosystem-based approaches. This is very important because we have mentions to both of these approaches. Uh, next slide, also on target 11, that is regulation of air, water, hazard, and extreme events. We also have the mention that this uh, regulation and this restoration, maintenance, and enhancing of nature contributions to people um, are going to happen through nature-based solutions and or ecosystem-based approaches. Next slide. We have also target 19, that is the target about finance, one of the most contested targets in the discussions of the COP15. Uh, we don't have a mention to nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches nor nature positive, which was another very contested term there. But a uh, very last minute, we had a, a point uh, D on this target that talks about innovative schemes, uh, such as ecosystem services, green bonds, biodiversity offsets, and credits. Um, we were very worried about this, and actually the last language that says with environmental and social safeguards was a last lobby effort. Uh, from youth, uh, we, but it's still something that keeps us worried, and I will explain you why later. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'm going to jump to the UNFCCC. Uh, on the last COP, we had a decision about forests, decision 14, that talks about uh, encouraging parties to consider nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches taking into consideration the UNEA resolution 5 slash 5. Next slide, please. 
And going backwards in the UN after policy, we have an article uh, 6.2 that is talking about internationally mitigated trade that mitigation, mitigation option. Uh, this is an important article, but because it is more related to uh, how we are going to transfer mitigation um, outcomes uh, towards nationally determined contributions. And this is uh, opening the space for market based approach. Next slide. On the same Paris Agreement, uh, and thanks to the effort of uh, some small countries, including Bolivia, we have a paragraph, an article about non market based approaches, uh, which is counteracting a little bit the last paragraph, the last article on market based approaches um, for a mitigation, adaptation, a finance and technology transfer, and capacity building. Next slide. Uh, sorry, that is a repeated slide, I think. Or, or was that the previous slide? Can we go to the next slide? Next slide. Okay, and here we have the UNEA resolution a uh, five slash five that uh, defines nature-based solutions. Uh, this is the first uh, multilaterally agreed concept of nature-based solutions before, but before that we didn't have a definition, but we had a lot of implementation of nature-based solutions and that was something uh, worrisome. Uh, this uh, acknowledges that uh, the concept of nature-based solutions is cognizant and in harmony uh, with the concept of ecosystem-based approaches that is also in all of these uh, decisions, at request you need UNEP to convene intergovernmental consultations. Uh, these to define further guidelines for the implementation of nature-based solutions and how we're going to finance them. Next slide. Finally, this is not a, late, a latest development, but it's important to take into account. A decision that we have on the CBD about the ecosystem approach that is very old from 1995, but it, it defines the ecosystem approach as a strategy for integrated management of land, water, and living resources that promote conservation and sustainable use in an equitable way. And it has some principles, 12 principles that are called the Malawi principles, uh, that are quite interesting because they, um, first, they are agreed already. And they talk about decentralization, they talk about uh, consider all forms of infor information and include all relevant sectors of society. But one of the most important principles here are that the ecosystem functions and uh, are, should be a, the, the, the integrity of the ecosystem should be a priority. Uh, and this is something that um, is crucial when we talk about these approaches to, to nature, conservation, and sustainable use. Can we go to the next one, please? We're going to talk about some risk of market and net, uh, market based and net approaches for biodiversity and climate now. Next one. First, carbon markets. Um, the discourse on how to uh, define international cooperation and this uh, global market to trade climate action and therefore climate ambition uh, is what we call carbon markets. Um, this is complicated uh, because uh, with carbon markets, uh, companies and governments can buy the climate mitigation action of others. Uh, this comes uh, with harmful implications to communities and ecosystems um, many times because the projects uh, where the mitigation uh, actions are going to be taken uh, place many times are on the territories of life uh, of indigenous, uh, where indigenous peoples and local communities have been conserving biodiversity for millennia. At the same time, uh, the large polluters uh, with this have a permit to keep polluting and keep the status quo. Next slide, please. The logic behind carbon offsetting uh, 
is very simple. It uh, says that there is an equivalence between the carbon emitted and the potential of carbon that be sequestered by offsets. Uh, so uh, you can uh, compare a metric ton of carbon that is emitted with a metric ton of carbon that is a uh, Uh, absorbed by uh, projects of alternative energies or avoided deforestation or projects of reforestation when you have trees that are going to at some point sequester all the carbon that you are emitting. Uh, so there is supposed to be this equivalence and this balance. Next slide, please. Um, this is more or less how a carbon offsetting project works. You have uh, an offset project that is set up in, for example, a forested area. Uh, the credits are calculated uh, there based on very different methods. Maybe they are going to be calculated by area, by biomass, uh, or by potential of the forestation that is going to be avoided. Uh, Any of these methods is going to land into an estimation of credits that are going to be generated by this project. Then a company makes a net zero strategy or they uh, decide, okay, we are going to be carbon neutral and uh, this is the strategy how we're going to do this. We're going to support these projects, let's say in the Amazon, in Africa, in Borneo, uh, and, uh, and we are going to support biodiversity conservation, restoration, and uh, climate mitigation actions. So they buy these credits and they, after buying these credits, they can make a climate claim saying we became climate neutral, we became carbon neutral, um, and they are offsetting their, their actions so they don't have to, to change any of their, of their activities that keep uh, sending carbon to the atmosphere. It's a simplistic way to say it. It's obviously more complicated and there are many different methods of calculating. And uh, there are companies who also try to mitigate their actions and offset the rest. But uh, the logic is this one. Next slide. The criticism uh, is first that we had uh, many past experiences of uh, carbon offsetting uh, that have been problematic. They have uh, they are used for greenwashing because there are a lot of companies that pollute and at very high emitters now uh, are greening themselves and uh, sharing uh, news and uh, marketing that say how green they become because they have uh, become climate neutral. Um, also, a, a pure focus on carbon sequestration is highly problematic. We have uh, with, uh, for example, red. Uh, that was a previous uh, strategy to reduce emissions uh, from deforestation and degradation. This strategy uh, accredited projects, for example, of a gold camp uh, that had a very um, that had a, a type of grass that was very efficient in sequestering carbon, but didn't um, because so only the carbon focus is important. So we have we have a gold a gold camp, but the grass is very efficient sequestering carbon, you can get the accreditation, but we have many projects from indigenous peoples and local communities conserving their lands that couldn't uh, get accreditation by red projects because they couldn't uh, measure or they couldn't use the, the tools for measuring the carbon sequestration that they were uh, providing. It opens a floodgate, it opens the floodgates for a market approach that will generate the cheapest compensation credit to the meters. So because it is cheaper to buy carbon credits, they will avoid taking dr drastic measures to uh, reduce emissions uh, with the decarbonization that we have of our economy. Next slide. There have been a lot of research and uh, some scandals on uh, different press uh, uh, and media uh, that have been showed how uh, these, make, uh, these schemes have failed. Uh, there has been a famous Guardian report uh, that revealed that 90% of the rainforest uh, carbon offsets emitted, uh, uh, emitted by the biggest certifier were worthless. Uh, we are talking about BERRA. BERRA is the lead on uh, carbon, certificate, carbon credit certifications, and this research has shown that more than 90% of these projects um, were claiming carbon credits that, in, that were not real and the real emissions were a very, very small amount of it. Okay. 
many other research are uh, claiming that this is just a license uh, for polluters to keep polluting. Uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, which shows another uh, research from climate accountability that has also been shared by The Guardian, uh, talking about uh, the majority of the projects of carbon credits that are potentially junk. This is because they are a, don't provide any additional a, value or they make exaggerated claims on how much carbon they are sequestrating or they inflate the baselines of they are not permanent. For example, they do a reforestation project, they do, they go there, they plant the trees, and after two, three years, there is no monitoring anymore, the trees die, and there is nothing like a carbon absorption there. Or a, there is leakage. Other organizations, like the Global Crop Forest Coalition, and other organizations they are uh, looking at case studies on how uh, the carbon offsetting projects are a failure and it brings uh, more problems than benefits to indigenous peoples and local communities. Next slide. And finally, we have biodiversity offsets uh, that are similar in approach to carbon offsets. They are supposed to compensate, but this time not for carbon uh, emissions, but for a biodiversity impact. And they are uh, built around the idea of non-net loss on biodiversity. And they are based on an assumption that uh, the ecosystems uh, can be balanced, the, the damage to the ecosystems can be, can be balanced or outweighed by producing. And I put like <laughs> a quotation marks there because we cannot produce nature or pre preserving nature elsewhere. Next slide. The logic of biodiversity offsets, it's similar to the logic behind a uh, carbon offsets with the difference that we are not comparing uh, metric tons of carbon with metric tons of carbon. We are comparing ecosystems, uh, an area of ecosystem that is lost with an area of ecosystem that is additional or gain. So if we gain more than that we lost, we have a non-net loss of biodiversity. The problem here is that ecosystems cannot be compared uh, because we know that each ecosystem is unique and the functions uh, that it uh, and the services that it provides to local communities are absolutely different and this cannot be replaced. Next slide. So the criticism, uh, I said already, these complex life forms are not a uh, cannot be reduced to a tradable statistics because they have an inherent value. Also biodiversity is a public good, so, so there shouldn't be a market for this. Uh, and finally, we cannot repeat the same mistakes that the carbon offset schemes have been made for the past 30 years. And you have seen already in, in the assessments. Next slide. This is just an example of how it should work. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the... Um, the offset, uh, the biodiversity offset credit schemes with the species from a government. And you can see how they generate a, a credits for different species. So uh, if you are going to, I don't know, uh, contribute to the convert to the conservation of the green and golden bell frog, you are going to uh, you have to pay 22,000 and more US dollars. Uh, but if you are talking about, uh, I don't know, uh, golden sun mat, it's going to be only 6,000, as if these things uh, could have a price on it. Next slide. So there is already some criticism because uh, there have been already some projects that have been implemented with these kind of schemes. There are also certifiers and there uh, are uh, governments that are jumping into, bio, into this biodiversity offsetting idea. Uh, although we we have already seen controversy in the projects because it affects uh, local communities, it doesn't replace the biodiversity and the long lasting impacts on biodiversity are not compensated. A couple of cartoons here, uh, for example, we have a forest with the animals that says a big show notice, a new address to be confirmed, or the, this ancient woodland has moved. Um, so um, our apologies for the inconvenient cause. So uh, this is a, more or less how, how it would look like and the impacts and the nonsense that, that goes uh, behind this idea of replacing biodiversity that has been lost elsewhere. Next slide. 
Uh, with this, I'm going to, um, well, the mitigation hierarchy is something that uh, a lot of us know. I am an environmental engineer, so the mitigation hierarchy has been somehow my Bible <laughs> for a long time, and I thought it worked. Uh, because uh, with the expectation of this, the, the implementation of this uh, mitigation hierarchy is that you have a biodiversity impact, but uh, you are going to try to avoid as much as possible. And the residual impact, you are going to minimize as much as possible using technology, using uh, other approaches to the project, so the residual impact becomes less. And, uh, and you're also going to restore inside what you have. So... Uh, your residual impact become, becomes very little, and this very little residual impact that you cannot minimize, you cannot avoid, you cannot restore, you're going to offset. And when you offset, you do such a good action that you have a net positive impact. That is the theory. The reality is that companies will not try to avoid too, too much, will not try to minimize, and won't, won't try to restore because these are very expensive actions. So they are going to jump to the offsetting part as soon as possible because the offsetting is cheaper than doing all of this. And then we have a huge offsetting component of the project and the avoidance and minimizing and restoring of the impact remains minimal. Next slide. So there are these uh, net approaches that uh, show the, that are the, the outcome of this arithmetical exercise with the uh, nature that I show with you on the UNFCCC, the CBD, and the a Convention to Combat a by Desertification. On climate, we have carbon neutral, net zero emissions, or climate neutral. They are all going to operate through carbon offsets. On the CBD, we have nature positive, biodiversity net gain, or non-net loss. They are going to operate through biodiversity offsets. And in the Convention on Desertification, we have claims on land degradation neutral and zero and net land degradation uh, that are going to operate through land restoration offsets. Next slide. The implications of these uh, offsetting and net approaches are that they ignore the uniqueness of uh, each ecosystem, the functions and benefits. Uh, I showed you already that my past ex experiences uh, have been mostly unsuccessful. There have been studies that show it that uh, biodiversity offsetting experiences in forest and uh, marine ecosystems that are highly complex that do not exist. Uh, they only, they, we have only uh, successful experiences in very simple ecosystems that you can really replace, like um, an, artif uh, an artificial lake next to a building that is going to disappear and you can put it in the next neighborhood, but you cannot do this with a rainforest or a coral reef. The total amount of planet offsets is unrealistic. We would need like three planets <laughs> to, to be able to offset all of the impacts that we have here. And finally, the ecological restoration science uh, cannot deliver the outcomes expected by offsets. It is a very new science where it's still understanding how nature regenerates itself and how many years it's going to take to the ecosystem to recover. So we cannot promise that we are going to restore this ecosystem. Next slide. Um, thank you so much, Myrna. Really, really appreciate all the amazing work that you've done and for this incredible presentation. We're actually, unfortunately, um, run out of time. So um, I would love to be able to circulate your slides to, to our participants so that they can read all of your uh, amazing work. But unfortunately, we, we have uh, reached our time for this session. Um, but it was so, so good to hear from you. And, and especially we got a few questions about offsets that you answered so comprehensively. So thank you so much. Um, maybe just uh, before we go, just a, a really quick question, which was just on um, your very, the very beginning of your presentation, you had um, a piece about how decision-making processes are, are unfriendly or hostile to young people. And it would be really good as we go into the closing of the session to understand, are there ways to make those spaces more accessible and more collaborative for young people? Yes. Um, well, it is a pity I couldn't go to the end of my presentation because there was an example on how for uh, the nature-based solutions, we managed to get a coalition between a uh, given Yango and Youth for Nature, uh, where we decided to get a youth position on nature-based solutions. Uh, and we first uh, decided to do a policy brief doing research on nature-based solutions, uh, try to get the critical voices, the warnings and the, and the perspectives on young people. Uh, 
and other organizations share this information with young people through webinars and through a youth-friendly uh, text. And then afterwards, uh, when we have our people informed, have a survey on nature-based solutions where we hear their voices, we compile their opinions, and we created a statement uh, that uh, talks about the importance of young people, of the integrity of the ecosystems, of the safeguards uh, for indigenous people, local communities, women and youth, how we have to be involved and how we are not going to tolerate more uh, greenwashing or offsetting that doesn't respect the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, the guardians of ecosystems and the integrity of ecosystems themselves. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, uh, uh, this is just an example on how uh, as young people can claim our spaces uh, in these decision-making processes and bring strong statements and be united because it is not only given or only Django, or only other youth organizations, the, 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 the more united we get, the stronger we are. And, the, and we are seeing some changes, at least in policy uh, and, and approaches from other organizations. Thank you so much. That That's a really beautiful example. And I'm sorry that you didn't get to go through everything. 25 minutes goes so, so fast, especially when you have so much to share. So thank you so much, Marina. And we'll circulate your slides to the participants so they can see all the amazing work you did to prepare, but really, really appreciate your time here today. And also really pre appreciate the call to action to have more youth movements collaborating with one another. So that's a really great note to end on. Um, thank you so much. Um, just uh, a reminder that the attendance form is here. Um, obviously, as, as we do with every session, it will also be sent by email and you have two weeks um, to, to watch the recording and to fill it out. Um, so you have lots um, lots of time to do that. Um, and we'll also be sending out further information about the certificates um, uh, and, and before the 30th as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, if we can just go to the next slide. Um, just a reminder that the final session of the course is on Monday, the 30th of October. Um, we'll be sending out everything, all the pre-prep information um, by email. So please look out for that. Um, and you can find that there. And we'll also be um, asking you for your feedback on the course. This is a feedback form that we've circulated a few times. Um, so you can send us feedback there. And also when the course ends, we'll have the opportunity to um, give some insight on how the course should be designed next time you run it. So we're hoping that we um, run the course again. Uh, and so we'd love your feedback and your thoughts um, as we move towards that. Um, and of course, our Terra partnership uh, is still live. You're still able to go. If you're having any trouble, um, do let us know. But um, you should, uh, the, the email with all the Terra information is there. And of course, our Slack is still there as well. So we send out the link to that um, every time after the session. Um, so with that, just a big thank you. And Agustin, I'll, I'll hand over to you for the last word and just a goodbye. Yeah, no, thank you all for joining us today again. And let's get ready for the next session, the Monday Terry of October. We are happy to find you here in the same space. And please use this uh, the form to help us with ideas on how we should continue with this program, because the most important thing that was shared today all over that is indigenous uh, communities, the territories, the nature-based solutions, and how the youth communities have to advocate together as one. Ciao, ciao.